thank you for the introduction. I'd like to thank Town Hall for hosting us tonight. We've been here several times. It's a wonderful experience. It's always a pleasure to be in Seattle. I've got lots of friends in the audience. It makes it even doubly nice to be here. And, uh, you know, this is a book that John and I have been working on for about two years. And we can date it really to January 2014 when Eric Schmidt, then the CEO of Google, uh, now Alphabet, went to Davos to speak at the Conference of the World's Financial and Business Leaders. And he gave the keynote address. And in that address, Schmidt said that in the next two or three decades, projects that Google was working on and that other high-tech firms were working on would eliminate a significant percentage of all the jobs in the economy. Uh, he said that for the next 20 or 30 years, the issue of unemployment would be the single dominant issue in politics in the world. And, you know, he had no reason to be an alarmist. This was, he, was, he was telling his fellow CEOs and investors what was very soon coming down the pike. This sort of got our attention when we heard about this. Uh, and we said, so this is sort of interesting, he's telling this at Davos, but you don't hear about this anywhere else. It's not like this is widely discussed in the media, in classes, by politicians. So we started to investigate it, and that was what led to this book. And I'll give you, at the very front, the basic uh, precy of our argument. What we argue is that he's right, and that this is going to lead to spectacular political upheaval, first and foremost, because it will become a political issue. And that what we should anticipate seeing, we are argued in the book, uh, was that there will be uh, the growth of tremendous activism among young people, and it will tend towards the political left. And there will also be tremendous growth of other types of more uh, negative activism. And we actually, in our proposal, when we wrote about this, we said to our editor, we said, the term that's used historically for what we're talking about is fascism. And she wrote back and said, well, wait a second. You can't write a book in America today and suggest that there's something like the F word applies. That's a pejorative term. No one will buy that argument. And then we said, well, that's where the evidence leads. We really got to put it in the book. And then about four months ago, she called us up and said, you know, I owe you guys an apology. <laughs> uh, Donald Trump sort of proved that side of the equation. Rehabilitating fascism is now a legitimate word in discourse, legitimate to be considered not just as a pejorative term. And also we talked about democratic socialism in the book, another term that's been rehabilitated and rejuvenated in American political culture. Uh, <clears throat> And we anticipate both Sanders' emergence and Trump's in the book, but we didn't think it was happening this quickly. We'll be honest, we thought we were looking two, three, four election cycles down the road. We thought the election cycle would catch up with this after much more activism on the ground took place. And in, instead, it's exploded on us. And if you read the book, I will confess, it will look like Bernie Sanders wrote it with us in large parts. Uh, because there's a very compatible argument to what Sanders has to make. Uh, for one thing, we talk at length when we, about the jobless crisis, not by blaming technology or discussing it in terms of technology, but by looking at existing trends in American capitalism and the labor market in the last 10 or 20 years. For young people under 30 today, we're living in a Great Depression. Uh, this is not a great situation about to go south. This is at the South Pole about to fall off the face of the earth for people under 30. Inequality has grown, poverty has grown, the youth labor conditions are dreadful, wages much lower than they were 30 or 40 years ago in real terms, uh, very little stability, lots of people doing these lame gig jobs where you're trying to patch together two or three things so you can pay your rent and eat. Uh, it's a dreadful situation. And our political system seems entirely disinterested in addressing the great crisis, and it's not just for young people, but it's growing across the board. And here's the other half of what we write about in the book, what we call citizenless democracy. We see exceptional corruption uh, of our governing system such that it's really incapable of addressing these crises. Now, this is something you're all familiar with. Uh, we live with it every day, the power of money in this country as in almost no, no other country on earth to dominate uh, the political situation. And as you've probably heard, this is probably a good time to have a political revolution to address this problem so we can solve the great social and economic problems we face. And our book basically makes that argument. But we make that argument really just in the first few pages, because uh, we really take off from there, and we really examine closely Eric Schmidt's claims. And we spent two years 
reading the engineering literature, the business literature, the business press, to see just how serious this stuff was about artificial intelligence, how serious robotics computerization is. You know, I've been studying and writing about the internet for 20, 25 years, and I think by my last book on this subject called Digital Disconnect, I was at the point where I was framing the internet as being the historical equivalent, not of television or the telegraph, but really an impact much closer to, say, the printing press or writing or the alphabet, something that fundamental. And if you know anything about communication history, those are the sort of changes that change not only history, they, they change everything. They even change arguably human nature. Uh, that the internet, the digital revolution is that of that magnitude. I'm beginning to think now, when we go into this next stage, that even that will not fully capture what we're about to enter. Let me explain. Uh, just a couple of uh, professors at Oxford who research uh, artificial intelligence, uh, economists actually, uh, now have determined that they think roughly 50% of existing jobs in the United States uh, will be uh, eliminated uh, within the next 10 or 20 years uh, by uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, that's not an uncommon feeling at all. Uh, there's a leading CEO a few months ago of one of the largest industrial corporations in the world in a private meeting that a former PhD student of mine was able to attend in Germany. Uh, he gave a very interesting presentation. Uh, he, he, he is a, someone, of, as I said, a large company of several hundred thousand workers in Germany in factories all over the world. And his workers in Germany are union workers who have really good wages, the sort of jobs American workers had 40 years ago. Uh, they're the backbone of the German middle class. And someone in the question and answer period asked the CEO, he said, is this stuff about automation and robotics? Is this really something serious that we should be concerned with? And he said, not only is it serious, we have the capacity right now to completely automate every factory we have in the world, including Germany. And he said, but we can't do it politically right now. That's the only thing that's really stopping us. Because, and this is the quote translated from German, if we were to automate our factories in Germany, the middle class would burn. Uh, German social order would collapse. That's how serious, in his view, it was. And in Germany, companies like the one he has has workers on their board of directors by law, so it makes it a little dicier to do things like that than it would be in the United States. But he also said it's just a matter of time till that happens. And then I think perhaps the most daunting appraisal of the situation we're entering came from uh, the head of the uh, robotics research program that was commissioned by the Defense Advanced Research Project, DARPA, the same people who did much of the research that gave us the internet uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they're still alive, they're still going strong, and they're coordinating much of the high-tech research in the United States today. And for the last 10 or 12 years, DARPA has had a robotics uh, research track where they've given prize for innovation, doing a lot of work on automation and robotics and artificial intelligence. And the head of it left DARPA, left the robotics project last summer and wrote a journal article which was quite illuminating when he talked about what was coming down the pike, and he didn't mean like 10, 20 years, but there was actually prototypes and operational almost immediately, if not immediately. And he, the term he used for what we were about to get, hitting us in the face at warp speed, he said we were, the human race was about to enter a Cambrian explosion. Now I thought when I read that, he was referring to an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, and so I tried to look it up to see you know, what movie it was. And I discovered, in fact, that's a term scientists use for the period 540 million years ago, a 20 or 25 million year period, when life on Earth went from being fairly simple, one and two cell simple organisms, this explosion of all diversity we see around us since then that took place. It wasn't a gradual incline from a billion or two billion years ago, but it was a flat line, this explosion, and then everything since then, starting with the dinosaurs and everything else. He said, we're the human races at the beginning of what's gonna be a Cambrian explosion. In other words, we have no idea what we're about to get into. It's gonna be something really serious. The only thing he said we can say with certainty that most jobs are history, very soon. The, the, the one thing these technologies can be applied for quickly and immediately is to replace most employment. And since it will be very profitable for firms to do so, they will, out of competitive pressure and the pursuit of profit, do so. Well, that got my attention too. Now, since computers first began in the 1940s during the Second World War, this notion of an explosion in automation has been uh, implicit even explicit in the discussion of it. By 1946, Fortune magazine even ran an article saying, we forecast the day will be of workerless factories. 
Uh, that was just, you know, barely had started and already they were talking about it. By the 1960s, there was a huge hysteria about automation, that all the jobs were going to be going. And the hysteria was very intense. Uh, in fact, President Johnson appointed one of the highest level commissions the, the country appointed in the 1960s to study whether automation would end employment and what could be done to prevent that from happening. It had top executives, top labor leaders, and top intellectuals, and it issued two very long and very excellent reports that found the basis for a lot of the work we did in the book. And uh, of course, they didn't happen then. Capitalism was much more vibrant and growing, so jobs lost could be replaced. Uh, unlike today, where capitalism is more abundant, more or less the private economy is dead in the water. Uh, and also, computers were laughably primitive then, laughably primitive. I mean, the, the cell phone that each of you has attached to your hand at most times, this cell phone, if the power in it, probably in 1965, would take a room this size to hold in this cell phone right here, if not a larger room than that. So the idea that that sort of technology was going to replace all jobs, pathetic or ridiculous, absurd, but no one knew that at the time. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of Moore's Law, that computer power doubles every year and a half. Well, Moore, Gordon Moore, who said that, uh, did that in 1965. And let's say you start in 1960 and you double computer power every year and a half. They'll do two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, get out a calculator and do two to the 28th power and see what sort of number you come up with. And then do two to the 32nd power. We're right now pretty much at two to the second, 32nd power zone. And we're at a point now, if you look at a graph and do, do this, it's a parabola where you're going straight up every year. The increases are off the charts. And that makes possible with this growth of computer power for artificial intelligence to do stuff that was unthinkable unthinkable five or 10 years ago, and stuff that we'll be able to do in five or 10 years is stuff that's unthinkable today. For example, you all know about driverless cars. 10 years ago, that was thought to be, on the oh, that'll never happen, give me a break. Driverless cars, impossible. Well, now they exist, the technology's here, it's perfected, it's ready to go. It's simply a political fight. Uh, when they're gonna get people off the road so they can get the cars on, and when businesses start buying driverless vehicles to do all their work. In some ways, this is a great thing. In a sane, rational society, driverless cars conceivably could be a much better use of resources, better for the environment, better for the quality of life. You wouldn't need as many cars in a city. There are lots of great things about the notion of a driverless car. In our economy, in our society, there's a slow, slight problem with that. The number one job for men in America today is driving a vehicle. A car, a bus, a truck, some sort of vehicle, delivery, uh, whatever it might be. In fact, it's by far the number one job. There's not even a number two or a number three. There's just also receiving votes at the bottom. It is a crucial job. What happens if we eliminate all those jobs? What happens to all those men? What are they going to be doing uh, if they're not driving vehicles? Well, this technology, basically once it starts, there aren't gonna be a lot of guys driving once companies can get driverless vehicles much less expensively, much more efficiently, who don't get tired, who don't need vacations, who don't need bathroom breaks, who don't get drunk, who don't fall asleep, they just work 24 seven until they go in to get re refitted. Uh, that's the world we're facing. And what this technological revolution raises are just very fundamental issues. Issues that are implicit in capitalism, which is for all the bounty that we see, the promise of the technologies comes that we need very few humans or very, very little labor to produce all we need to live a satisfactory life. Under the auspices of our current economic system, instead of liberating us, it imprisons us, it makes our lives more uh, insecure, it makes people more poor, more desperate, it gives them less to do. Uh, it becomes, instead of a source of liberation, it becomes a source of imprisonment. And for capitalism as a system, it really presents a fundamental existential problem, uh, one that we first saw in the Great Depression, but now is returning again. If people don't have jobs, or, or the jobs they have are very low wages, there's no income to buy products. And if people can't buy products, then businesses have no incentive to invest and hire people or create more stuff. And the system dies or it slows down. And I'd argue, and we argue in the book, that that's the point we're at, we're at now. We have to rethink our economy. Uh, capitalism might be really good at getting a, an economy from zero to 60, but once you get where we are, it doesn't seem to be very good at enhancing uh, the, the public good. It's not, in fact, quite the opposite. This seems like a radical argument. It seems like a socialist argument, and to some extent it is. But really, even though the greatest of our mainstream economists have recognized that capitalism would eventually get to this point, John Stuart Mill, 
Thorsten Veblen, and perhaps most famously, John Maynard Keynes, the greatest of the 20th century economists, who in 1930 wrote a great essay in which he said, 100 years from now, uh, we will have the technological capacity so there will not be very much labor that's necessary and everyone could live a relatively decent standard of living. He said the economic problem will be solved. Capitalism will have solved it. That's a pretty smart guy. If you predicted the year 2030, which is pretty much the year we're looking at in the discussion we're making now. And Keynes wrote that in 1930. And Keynes said that would present a fundamental problem for an economy based on profit. And he didn't really have a way of figuring out how it would work out, but he, he noted that once you don't have economic scarcity as a necessity, you know, capitalism really has, doesn't really function, it doesn't have a role to play uh, that it's played historically. We argue in the book that what we desperately need is a post-capitalist economy where these great fruits of this technology are shared by all of us. We all take advantage of it uh, and, they're, and they're managed democratically. And we also argue that this is a political issue. It's not an economic issue. It's not a technological issue. It's an issue that's going to be settled through politics and political activity. As I've already said, our political system, though, is not up to the job at all. The research shows, it's not even debated anymore, that our political system is mired in corruption. Uh, we're a citizenless democracy where people really don't feel like they're playing a role, and they aren't really playing a role for the most part. Uh, and so in the book, what we argue is where we need to go now is we need to, the way you solve the economic problem, the way you solve joblessness and underemployment and poverty and inequality, is not to regard it as a technological issue, is not to regard it as an economic issue, but instead to regard it as a political issue. And the great crisis is making our governing system not a citizenless democracy, but an actual functioning participatory democracy. And in the process of doing that, what seems now like the most depressing dystopia imaginable can become instead an extraordinary chance, a wonderful opportunity to go places humanity has never gone before. It's a pretty broad range we have in front of us right now. It's in our hands and it's going to be settled in the lifetime of most of the people in this room, certainly all the young people in this room. So what do, how do you do that? How do you rejuvenate or rejuvenate for the first time a democracy? We argue that the key to way to understand democracy is a concept we call democratic infrastructure. Just like an advanced economy doesn't exist just because someone walks out and says, hey, I'm gonna do something economically. Uh, it exists because you have an economic infrastructure. You have transportation, you have communication, sewage, water, electricity, a financial and legal infrastructure. So if someone wants to do something, be it a business, a cooperative, they, they, get, they have something to fit it into that's already in existence that makes it easy to do. The same thing's true of democracy. Just having the right to vote doesn't amount to a hill of beans if you're illiterate, you have no idea what's going on, there's no one to vote for, uh, you know, and the decisions, well, whoever you vote for has no influence over the decision, so they don't listen to you if you vote for them. And we, in the United States today, unfortunately, have a shriveled democratic infrastructure. The core components of a democratic infrastructure include having a viable, credible uh, journalism and free press system, having high quality education for everyone, uh, so that there's not a class divide in how well education is distributed. Having uh, checks on inequality and militarism to proven cancers to uh, self-government. Uh, and there's also checks on corruption because corruption and money in politics, again, is another proven cancer to democracy. So what we need to have is a, a functional democracy with a healthy, vibrant democratic infrastructure. Then the problems that John and I described in the book that I've just been mentioning, can be solved, at least in a manner that's the best possible solution to serve people. They won't be solved by those who currently are debating them that we aren't invited to the table. And in the United States, the great argument, of course, is the great line that said, is that when decisions are being made, if you're not at the table when those decisions are being made, you're what's being served for dinner at the table. And right now, the American people are on the plate, they're not at the table. And democracy means you get them at the table as full participants in the discussion. Now, conservatives today and proponents of the status quo say this is all a lot of liberal BS. America was founded on whoever makes the most money wins. The whole point of the country was to set it up so people could accumulate as much property and take care of number one, and if someone can't make it, you know, that's, that's their problem. Uh, and this democratic infrastructure stuff's just a lot of hooey. Uh, this is nonsense, and in the book we go in great detail. In fact, the, America, the history of America 
is the history of great struggles over making it how democratic the country is going to be. This goes right back to the Constitution and the founding of the country. New research is going more into detail in the spectacular debates uh, in the colonies and through the revolution on how democratic this country should be. Who could vote? What, how would governance work? What was the obligations of the government to the people? And what we find is it's an incredibly important issue that's been lost oftentimes uh, to the common uh, thinking today because it's not talked about. We've lost touch with the notion of democracy so much in the last few decades, in the sort of era we've lived in where money runs everything. Uh, in the book, we look at a couple of periods in particular in the 20th century. And the 20th century is very important because between 1900 and say around 1970, the United States became a vastly more democratic country by all the criteria I just uh, mentioned. Uh, we became more egalitarian. We be the governance became far less corrupt. Uh, social mobility increased dramatically. Uh, widespread universal public education became common by 1970. F higher education was virtually free in public universities by the late 1960s. Uh, their corruption was at an all-time low uh, by, the 19 by 1970. Uh, we had, for the first time in American history, universal adult suffrage by the early 1970s. In 1900, you know, what, 35% of the population was eligible to vote, if that. Uh, in the United States. So the country made tremendous advances. Now, it wasn't a straight line. There were ebbs and flows. But it's an important part of our history that's been lost sight of, because we probably peaked around the early 70s in a lot of our democratic indicators, not all of them. Two periods in particular are especially important to all of us in this room as we look at the political era we're about to enter. The first one is the 1930s. Uh, in the Depression, and then World War II. And this is important because this is the one historical period in which there was mass unemployment and underemployment across the entire industrial world, the Great Depression. And the Great Depression begat uh, massive unemployment, and, and it begat the crisis that led to World War II. Uh, and there were really two ways out of the Great Depression that were proven in that era. One of them was what was loosely called Keynesianism or social democracy or in the United States, the New Deal. And this was the idea that you would try to expand the democratic infrastructure, uh, provide employment for people at a living wage, uh, reduce inequality and poverty, get money pumped up in the economy at the bottom going upwards, and this would give businesses incentive to invest and it would grow and you could have a healthy, vibrant democracy and economy. Now, of course, I'm crudely summarizing it, but that's one option. That was the New Deal option. The other option to deal with the uh, depression and mass unemployment was what we found in Germany, which was fascism. And there, basically, you got full employment, but you got full employment not by empowering those at the bottom, but by enslaving them. Uh, you got full employment by having pure, the government spending go almost exclusively to militarism, uh, and to warfare and not to public services and public goods. Uh, and it got the same effect. And it led, uh, since the system is predicated on militarism, it led to spectacular uh, wars. And the World War II was the immediate consequence of fascism. Now, Franklin Roosevelt, when he was the president of the United States during the Second World War, was obsessed with how do we prevent fascism from returning. He knew by the middle of the war that they would defeat fascism. It was pretty obvious that it was just a matter of time. But he said, how do we, what can we do to make sure fascism never comes back to the world again? Because he also knew if it ever came back to the world again, to a country like Germany, which had been the wealthiest, most powerful country in Europe, and the second most powerful country in the world uh, in 1933 when Hitler came to power, if it ever came back again, it might be the end of the planet, given the type of weapons that were being developed in the world at that time. And it became a great concern. He did studies. He was obsessed with the idea that democracy was the only way. He looked at the countries that, that had fascism, that went to fascism, like Germany and Japan and Italy. And he said they never had strong democracies at that moment. Uh, they were corrupt. The people lost faith in them. The center had collapsed. Uh, and the, pe the people abandoned hope in democracies being able to solve the problems because of that. So he, he said, what can we do in the United States to prevent it from returning? And also, most importantly, and this is quite striking, to prevent it from ever happening in the United States. He didn't regard fascism as a phenomenon that only people in other countries could experience, but he said it was a very real threat in the USA. And in 1944, in his State of the Union address, he devoted the entire address to this topic. And what he argued was that the United States needed to amend the Constitution 
and had a whole new series of amendments, what he called the Second Bill of Rights, or the Economic Bill of Rights, explicitly to strengthen democracy to limit the possibility of fascism in this country. What did he call for in the Second Bill of Rights? He called for the right to a job at a living wage. Everyone should have a job at a living wage. The right to have trade unions, free legal trade unions. The right to health care. Hey, has anyone ever heard about that? The right to education is a right, not something you might have access to if you can afford it, but as a right. Uh, the right to housing. The right, every person has a right to housing because they're a human being. Uh, these were the things. There were other things in there too, but these were the core elements of what's called uh, the Second Bill of Rights or the Economic Bill of Rights. Now, unfortunately, FDR died not too long after that. He never got it uh, pushed beyond this point. And it never, he was hoping at least it would be passed in legislation and approved by the Supreme Court, if not passed as amendments. And it never got to that point, too. But interestingly enough, to give some sense of the scope of the Second Bill of Rights, or the Economic Bill of Rights, the one piece of legislation that did come out of it, which is just a small part of the whole package he had in mind, is considered one of the three or four most important pieces of legislation of the 20th century, the GI Bill which basically gave returning soldiers uh, education, loans for businesses uh, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And it made it possible really to expand the quality of the middle class in the United States in the post-war era. <clears throat> now, it didn't die though. In fact, the second Bill of Rights or the Economic Bill of Rights had a great history. Eleanor Roosevelt, his widow, who was very active politically for many years after uh, he, FDR died, took the language of the Second Bill of Rights and crafted it into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a, bill, a treaty signed by every nation in the world today, to my knowledge, or most of them, including the United States. Uh, and it, the language of the Second Bill of Rights is now in the, the constitutions of many countries around the world, verbatim language from what FDR said in that speech in 1944 in his State of the Union address. And here's the really interesting thing. In 1945, most people in the world, and certainly the allied countries, let's put it that way, thought that Germany and Japan were hopelessly incapable of democracy. I mean, Germany had been in two world wars, they had had fascism, the Holocaust. J Japan seemed like a country that never was capable of democracy. And so what were they gonna do with these countries that seemed you know, hopeless? How could you prevent them from becoming military superpowers, rebuilding and starting another crazy war? That was a real genuine concern. And what the United States did, in the, when they occupied Japan under General MacArthur and Germany with the other allies, is they rewrote the constitutions of both those countries. We literally wrote the one in Japan and then said, sign here. The Germans got to play a larger role in theirs. But if you look at both constitutions, they basically have the entirety or close to the entirety of the Economic Bill of Rights, what FDR wrote in it, because they wanted to prevent fascism from returning to those countries. So how effective has, was, that, was that in Germany and Japan? Well, it's interesting. Every year, The Economist magazine does something called the Economic, Bill of, uh, Economic Democracy Index. Uh, and it judges every country in the world on how democratic it is, and it rank orders them. Uh, and it uses the criteria, basically, most people use, of lack of corruption, uh, effective governance, freedom, and liberty. And the two most democratic countries in the world, of all the countries with at least 50 million population in the world today, according to The Economist, are Germany and Japan. And it's not a coincidence they had that constitution. It's not a coincidence they had that constitution. The influence also uh, extends into American history. Martin Luther King in the 1960s created a freedom budget with A. Philip Randolph, his vision of how America could be reconstructed. It had included the entirety of the Second Bill of Rights. Uh, and then today, last fall in November, Bernie Sanders was asked to give a speech on how he defined socialism. And if you saw the speech he gave at uh, Georgetown University, he based it on FDR's Second Bill of Rights. He says, this is what I consider democratic socialism. So it's a very powerful piece. Robert Dahl, the great uh, Yale political scientist, once asked rhetorically, uh, if the American Constitution is so great, how come no other countries have ever adopted it? And we now know the answer. They have adopted it. They just adopted the FDR version from the 1940s. They didn't adopt the one from 1787. So we look at that period because we think it really gives us a grounding of what we have to deal with, the great crisis coming up in front of us, so we can have a humane democratic resolution of it rather than something that will be inhumane uh, and highly unwanted and militaristic. The other period we look at in some detail is the 1960s and early 1970s for a number of reasons, and I'm going to just collapse this on one point, although we go into much greater detail in the book. This was the period, as I said earlier, of the automation hysteria, 
But it was also the period when the first time people across society widely considered what it would be like to be in a world where there was no longer scarcity. They said, what would it mean to be in a world where no one had to work, people didn't have to work as hard as they always did and just accumulate goods? What else was there to life besides material possessions? You know, the hippies are the most famous representatives of it, but it, was, it went far beyond that. Uh, the new left in, in, in Europe and the United States considered this, and the famous slogans of the French revolutionaries who fought France to a, a halt in May 1968 was, their two slogans were, all power to the imagination, and be realistic, demand the impossible. Can you imagine social movements, if that's your two slogans to bring a country to? Well, the idea is we can do vastly better. We can have a fundamentally radical vision to improve life in a post-scarcity era when people don't have to enslave themselves to material goods and to the production of material goods to merely survive. We're, we move beyond that. We think there are important lessons in that period, and there were striking developments of people trying to think creatively about how we could move to a post-capitalist society that would be democratic and take human beings to a very different place. And again, that's the discussion we need to have, so that's something we need to look at again and take seriously and learn from. Of course, that period ended rather abruptly in the 1970s, and we went into uh, a darker zone that we've been in since then, one uh, where the idea that democracy could work has been diminished, the idea that government could do good things for people rather than be a source of simply oppressing businesses uh, has been lost, and the notion of public service has been pretty much shuttered aside for the idea of making as much as you can and getting in, getting in while the getting's good. Uh, I think it's pretty clear now, looking at the world today, that that moment uh, is over, that, the, that has run its course. And I think this is either going to be the last election of the 20th century or the first election of the 21st century, but we're not going back. Uh, we're entering a new terrain, uh, and it's an exciting terrain, uh, and it's one that in our book tries to define exactly how to understand it. The politics are thick, they're intense, and when I want to understand how to do something politically, there's only one person I'm interested in hearing from first and foremost, and that's my co-author, who's somewhere in this room, John Nichols. Come on up, John. Thank you. Bob McChesney. Yes. <laughs> the lighting is very generous to you. I cannot see you, but I know you are beautiful. Uh, where to begin except to say that it's important to recognize, Bob was being very serious when he said we, we like to think of ourselves as visionary and, and forward looking and imagining what is coming, telling you about all these amazing things and also helping you to sort through them. But we really didn't anticipate that our book would come out at a time when America was having a serious discussion about socialism and fascism. And uh, so much of what we wrote about has rocketed forward. We were lucky because as we were concluding the writing of the book, uh, many of these developments have started to occur. So we've integrated them in and, and we see them as a part of it, but we can't tell you exactly what will happen this year. Uh, what we can tell you is this, and this is important. The reason that we decided to write this book, as Bob has begun to tweak out, is because we recognized an incredible disconnection between what we were seeing as we traveled the world and went to international conferences, some of which are held at castles, quite appropriately. And, and they're filled with people who dress very well and drink mineral water and by all accounts love their children and you know, there are the CEOs of major companies, Google and, and Mozilla and other firms. And, and we were, I, especially I was able to be in these meetings because some of our previous books have become kind of a big deal in Europe. And as a result, you get invited to you know, join. And then as you come the second or third year, uh, you're sort of accepted as part of the group. They forget that you've written you know, rather more critical books about issues that maybe they don't always agree on with you. And so you become part of the discussion. You're not sneaking in or anything. You're just there. And they, they let their guard down a little bit. And they have the discussions, the normal discussions of CEOs and billionaires and wealthy and connected people and people who run think tanks today. 
and the normal discussions that they have are about nothing except the coming jobless economy. They, this is a huge topic for them. They talk about it all the time. They actually have these, you know, they have whole like lit up boards, you know, where they will show how many tweets have been sent in the last, uh, you know, two minutes and how many Facebook posts. They, they literally, they, they, the one thing you realize very quickly is that we can't even begin to imagine how much they know about us. They know so much. They gather so much data from us that they are on top of it at levels that, that make, I mean, the poor NSA folks can just run to keep up. But the interesting thing is that they don't look backward. They do look forward. And so when they have these conversations, they literally talk, not in some draconian way, but they talk about the industries that are going to disappear. They talk about the jobs that are going to disappear. And they aren't talking about menial jobs or drudgery. They're talking about good middle class and even upper middle class jobs. This is not something that's going to happen to somebody else. This is something that's going to happen to people you know. And when they have these conversations, though, they don't have it in that way. They're delighted by the, the bells and the whistles and all the things that show up on their screens. And they find it this fascinating, interesting future. And it's always going to be okay for them because they know something that most of us only begin to recognize or we put it in a different language. We don't connect to it as well as we should. They know that if they take away, not, not out of some desire, they don't want to, they could care less about getting rid of jobs. It's just a way to save money. Eliminating industry is just a way to, to make money. Automating is just a way to make more money. It's not, they don't hate you or they don't hate the job. They just want to not have to pay you money to do it. And they know a very interesting thing, which blows away all of our thinking. Because we are, we're still locked in the Henry Ford past of 100 years ago. We think that the CEOs of major companies, when they make products, right, that they will, they will pay us a good amount so we can buy the products. They think we, the consumers, you know, are part of something with that. We're not anymore. That's not how they think of it. That's not how they think of it. Because they live in a world where they know that we are quite willing to redistribute massive amounts of wealth upwards. We don't object. We actually let them take immense amounts of money. And you know, really kind of alter the whole economic structure. We, and we basically say, well, you know, some of it will trickle down on us. And they know also that they can do global trade deals that literally take away our small d democratic rights to, to make fundamental decisions about the environment, about work life, about our communities, about almost everything that matters to us. And they know that by and large, even though we don't like it, we will elect people who tell us that they're going to make them better the next time. Yeah, it, yeah, NAFTA didn't work. Okay, China free trade will be better. Yeah, China free trade didn't work. Well, CAFTA will be better. Well, CAFTA didn't work. Well, the TPP will be better, right? It's always going to be, somehow it's going to work. And, and they know that somehow they keep doing, these CEOs know that that keeps happening. And this is the thing they know, the biggest thing they know. We, the people, we like to eat. And some of us like to eat more than others, but we generally like to eat. And so they know that when they reduce the number of jobs, when they wipe out whole industries, we will not, we will not say, hold it, what, what, I object. Because we didn't object when they wiped out whole industries with their trade deals. We didn't object when they massively culled out our workforce. They, we, didn't, we haven't objected 40 years into stagnant wages. We haven't objected to the change from a situation where one person in a family could work while someone else stayed home with the kids and while we had you know, enough income to actually you know, do all these things and our kids could go to college and instead of having massive debt that would last for the rest of their lives, it was actually something you could pay for with a part-time job. We didn't object to any of those changes. So why would they worry that when they take away massive numbers of jobs? Because they know that we will work harder. We will come earlier 
and stay later. We'll keep trying to cobble together an existence. We will, I know this is gonna sound crazy, they believe that we will take our private cars and troll around the streets of cities trying to pick people up and give them rides for a little bit of money and we'll, and we'll come to some crazy German word like Uber or something like that. They, they believe that will happen. They believe we will get so desperate that we'll take rooms in our homes and rent them out and call it Airbnb. They believe correctly, correctly, that even as they cull out stable jobs that have real hours and schedules and benefits and enough pay to support people, they know that we'll just keep trying to cobble something together. And so they don't see this as some sort of bad calculus. They believe that there's a whole bunch more wealth to be redistributed upwards. And they also know something else. The last, the last institutions that will ever talk about this in a serious way are those that make up our media. They know that our media will never, ever say, hold it, we're stopping this ridiculous conversation about Donald Trump's hands <laughs> because we can see in the foreseeable future Eric Schmidt, the head of Google, the top experts at Oxford, people, the most, the people that really do work on this stuff are telling us we are within years of a progressively more jobless economy and maybe that matters more than Donald Trump's hands, right? They know the media won't do that because the media is a dumb beast. It is a dumb beast that just simply wants to be fed. And the smartest politician in America is Donald Trump because he just keeps feeding it something more and that dumb beast follows after him. So they know so well. No, this is, I'm not kidding about this. They're well aware that they're not going to get called out by the media. And they know something else. They know that our politicians don't know how to talk about this, don't bother to talk about this. Our politicians don't like to tell us scary things. Our politicians don't like to entertain real discussions. When somebody tries to do it, we shun them off to a third party. We say, and we make it hard for them to get on the ballot, and then if they do get on the ballot, we don't let them in debates, and we, we keep pushing them aside. I mean, whether you like Bernie Sanders or not, do you realize that, that there are studies, he has gotten one-tenth as much coverage in this campaign season on all media as Donald Trump. One-tenth as much in, in basic, I should say in broadcast media, and in evening news, stuff like that. And in fact, on one network, ABC, at the end of last year, they found out Donald Trump had an 80 to one ratio of coverage. This is ABC Evening News. But that was cheating. That was actually, because they had rounded Bernie Sanders' one up to one. <laughs> it was actually 20 seconds. So it was a 240 to one ratio. So somebody's trying to actually have a little bit of a serious discussion, forget it. And they know that our politicians, most of them have, have been trained, well-trained to feed the dumb beast. And so they're having these discussions and they're deep into them and they're very serious and they worry about it a little. They know that there's gonna be problems. They slow down some things they do because it's overwhelming, but they're deep into it and we're nowhere near it. We're on the sidelines. We are pushed aside. We are left out. And we are in terrible danger that everything we know will change and it will be changed by a handful of people sitting in a distant room and telling us it is the only alternative. This is what we must accept as we must accept austerity, as we must accept wars that we don't need. All these things, we have to accept this too. Now, do you know what the interesting thing is? We already refuse to accept it. We're actually, they're wrong. This is a really weird thing because something bizarre has happened this year. There is only one way to explain Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. There's only one way to explain them. A 74-year-old Democratic Socialist from Vermont who has dedicated his life to struggle for economic and social justice, 
and a billionaire populist who has dedicated his life to finding his third or fourth wife and who has literally, I mean, is the, is the most, who literally does press conferences after he wins primaries that are infomercials for his incredibly lame products. No, last night he was actually holding up Trump magazine and talking about what a great magazine is. It's so great, they give it away for free. So, but we got these both of them. Why do we have both of them? Why is this happening? It's not that hard to understand. 18, 19, 20-year-old kid in this country has grown up marinated in, te in new technology. They literally, this, I, I, I go to conferences all over the world and they, you know, they talk about uh, artificial intelligence. We open the book, you know, there are 15,000 people around the world now who have sent away for a chip, programmed it, cut their finger open, inserted it into themselves, put a bandage around it, sealed it in, and then let their skin heal so that they have a microchip in them that can open doors, start computers, do all sorts of things. They have genetically, they physically altered themselves to keep up with computers. 15,000 people have already done this. This is a detailed fact. And, and, and the interesting thing about it is that, you know, in this context, young people are well aware of what's happening with technology and where it's going. They literally, you try and take a phone away from a, from a, a kid, right? <laughs> you know, the artificial intelligence experts said at one time, maybe we're going to have to genetically modify ourselves. Maybe we're going to have to, you know, do all sorts of selection things to keep up with computers. And they said, no, it turns out we already genetically modified ourselves. We gave them a phone that had all this, all this power and put it at the end of their arms. And it's now growing into the arm. It can't be separated. <laughs> we know that. And the kids know that too. They look at the future. They look at this gig economy. They look at all this structural reality. They're told that they have to take $100,000, $200,000 worth of debt just to get an, a degree. And then they're told that there's probably not going to be a job for them at the end of it. And so they have already voted with their feet. They've gone to a Bernie Sanders rally, right? Bernie Sanders is getting 85% of the vote of young people, as Bob pointed out. So this political reality is already playing there. Now, it's not articulated, and, and, and shame on Bernie Sanders for not fully articulating it, for not, you know, he's, he's very, very good at calculating, uh, chronicling the, the decay. He's not as good as he should be at talking about what's coming next. I don't, I'm not condemning him for that. I'm just saying that, that there's a pivot here that he has work to do too. But then the other alternative, who's blowing up on the things on the Republican side? Who's causing an unexpected vote? This Trump guy. Now, the people at his rallies are not young. They're much older. There's a lot of 55, 58 year old guys who lost their job at the factory and then they did some retraining and they ended up in a, in a lower level paying job. Remember the term retrain is not a promise but a threat. And they, they then kind of got a job in a warehouse and now they're working at the Quickie Mart and they're thinking things aren't working out too well for them. Right, so they go to a Donald Trump rally and you know what Donald Trump says to them? Make America great again. Keyword being again, let's go backwards. Let's go back to something. Well, how do we get back there? Well, the only way we ever go backwards, right? We look around the room, we find somebody to blame, somebody who doesn't look quite like us, and we blame them. We divide people enough, we make it ugly enough that we can go back to some glorious past. Well, the fact of the matter is we can't go back to any past. But what Trump is saying is so attractive it's gotten to the point where he's very likely to be the nominee of the party of Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower. This is big deal stuff. What I would tell you is we've already come into the moment. This is, we, it's not articulated. Our media doesn't cover it. Our candidates don't even talk about it well, but the politics of our time is already reflecting this. It is the only way to explain what is going on right now. And What's going to go on next is going to be more volatile, more complex. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we get out of this? How do we get, because this poor woman sitting up front is starting to look a little bit scared. <laughs> Slightly depressed. <laughs> you know what? Our book is an optimistic book. I'm not, it is a very optimistic book. Because we detail all this because you cannot be an optimist without knowledge. There is, there is no such thing as a naive optimist. That's a fool, right? It is. No, knowledge, knowledge is what allows you to be optimistic. 
an understanding of what's really going on, and then coupled with history, when you understand what has been done when we have gone through this before, because we have always gone through this. This has happened again and again and again. Technological progress has caused radical dislocation, radical changes in our lives, and we have struggled to figure out what we, how to deal with it, what we should do, and we have made terrible mistakes, and then slowly we have figured out again and again and again how to deal with it and how to reassert our power over our own lives. And I'll use just one example. In the book we write about, ton, we, there's a lot of history in this book because the history is what empowers us. 200 years ago, we had an industrial revolution that was every bit as dislocating and, 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 and radical and wild. At a time when people believed that kings and queens served by the divine right of God, right? Suddenly everything they knew was being blown apart. How many of you have gone on a vacation to England, right? How many of you went to a village, one of those cute little villages with thatched roofs and a, and a church in the middle of it and a little, maybe a little commons and that, and you thought, you know, maybe if things work out for me, I wouldn't mind living in a place like this. This looks pretty idyllic, bucolic, and wonderful. Well, in the north of England 200 years ago, that's where people lived. The villages where, where, where they lived. And you know what they did? They had little looms in their houses they, and crafts, and they actually made things. It was very creative. They sustained themselves by growing food. They had their children around them. And while it was certainly imperfect, no doubt about that, it wasn't, it wasn't absolutely perfect, it was not such a bad life. And then suddenly people came along and said, you know what? We can make a lot more money if we take all of you out of the villages and move you to cities and put you in slums and have you work in big factories on these huge looms, and maybe even we'll bring your kids in and we'll chain them to the machines and let them work there too. As this was happening, William Blake, the poet, said, he looked at these and he said, these are dark satanic mills. Dark satanic mills. He said, you will lose your humanity. And the people realized that as well. And so you know what they did? They responded as the way many people do to technology when it first comes in and changes their lives. They decided to destroy the machinery. They took as their hero an imaginary figure, King Lud, and they went into the mills as Luddites, and their other hero was Captain Swing, the guy who with one swing of a hammer could destroy an entire loom, right? And they, they ruined factories. They tore apart the machinery of the future because they were so terrified that it would make their lives horrific. The British government was so terrified by this, so horrified by this reaction, by these people saying, we do not want to be wrenched out of our existence as we know it. We don't want to be turned into something that we are not, that they sent the troops to Lancashire in the north of England. At one point, as we chronicle in the book, there were more British troops in the north of England putting down the revolt against this change than they were fighting Napoleon. This was how much it scared them, but they won. They beat the Luddites. They beat them. And then the Luddites had to go and work in the dark satanic mills. And they worked from before dawn till after nightfall. But they would gather. They couldn't gather in churches. They couldn't gather in town halls. They would gather on full moon nights in the woods, on the top of hills. And they would talk to one another about what they could do to stop this, to get their lives back. And they thought about, do we destroy? Do we form armies? Do we kill the people that are doing this to us? They looked at all these possibilities and it, nothing worked for year after year after year and yet they would keep meeting in all these tiny clubs and talking. And then somebody said, you know what? Maybe the problem isn't the technology. Maybe the problem isn't even, you know, some of these core economic ideas and the powerful people that implement it. Maybe the problem is that we don't have any power, that we aren't at the table making the decisions. And so in a very short amount of time, we talk about this in the book, it's a wonderful thing. When that realization swept through England, people started to say, we don't need to talk about all sorts of big structural economic changes. We need to talk about one thing, democracy. We need to take control of the politics of this country so that we can begin to influence the economics of this country. And they formed a Chartist movement. In one year, they gathered more than 3 million signatures 
on petitions. When those petitions were rejected, they gathered four million. They marched, they died in the struggle for democracy. And in a short amount of time, they instituted universal suffrage. That means every, all men could vote initially. Then they changed the political processes. They eliminated corruption in their politics. They forced honest elections. And within an amazingly short amount of time, they began to open the door to trade unions, to child labor laws, to a social welfare state, to votes for women, to a transformation of the circumstance of human beings. They did not make everything perfect, but they pushed the politics to a place that was radically different, and then they pushed the economy itself to a place that is radically different. If you don't think that is the case, just imagine this notion, an eight-hour day. Just imagine this notion, an end to child labor. This is the kind of thing. They, they remade work, and they remade society because they had to. And we chronicle in the book that the same thing happened in America 100 years later with the populist progressives leading into the New Deal. We always think that some great guy came along and showed us the way out. Well, the smartest politician this country ever had, who never won an election for president, was Eugene Victor Debs. The head of the Socialist Party ran for president many times at the start of the 20th century. And he said one time, Mr. Debs, you're such a great guy. He says, tell us what to do. And Debs said, if I could lead you into paradise, I wouldn't do it. Because if I could lead you in, someone else could lead you out. Don't trust the politicians, trust yourselves. The fact of the matter is, we are entering into a point in our history where we don't have an option of whether to demand a democracy where we literally are in charge. And I know what you're gonna say. You will say to me, yeah, yeah, but see, we live in the worst of all times. We live in the most difficult of all times. It was so easy for those people working 12, 14, 16 hour days and chained in the machines. They had it so much easier than we do now. And so there's no way we could do it. It was so easy for you know, the, the women who fought for voting rights you know, 100, 150 years ago. You know, I mean, all they had to do was starve themselves and, and get chained to things and beaten and jailed. I mean, that was a breeze. It was so easy for people who fought for civil rights. It was so, so easy for the trade unionists who were literally machine gunned down. It was so easy for the women who worked at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. It was just so easy in the past. It's harder now. Wrong. It's not harder now. Our challenge is to understand that we have made tiny demands. We have asked for so very little. We have objected so little when they have taken so much. And now they propose to take our jobs and our livelihoods and every bit of the structure of the lives that we know and radically change them. And our answer should not be to say, yes, we will work harder for less. Our answer should be that we were promised technology would yield wondrous benefits for all of us. Every great inventor, every great thinker said that technological progress would free us from drudgery. It would free us from slavery. It would free us from everything that was evil and wrong in our lives and allow us to live beautiful and good lives. That's what Tesla said. That's what Einstein said. That's what Edison said. Every one of them said the technology would make our lives better. And they were all right. But what was wrong was we let the powerful and the rich take all of the benefits for themselves. Well, brothers and sisters, it is time for us to understand we can't give it up anymore because they will take it all. It is time for us to organize at a level that we never have and to recognize that as these changes come forward, it will not be that hard because it will be so overwhelming for so many people that they will turn to us and say, what do we do now? Our answer has to be, we will not do what Donald Trump proposes. We will not turn on our neighbors. We will not turn against our fellow human beings. 
We will do what Thomas Jefferson, an imperfect president, proposed. We write about this in the book. 200 years ago, at a time of great economic turbulence in this country, John Adams, horrible president, John Adams started taking away basic liberties. He started to jail political opponents. He started to jail newspaper editors. They used the so-called Alien and Sedition Acts. At that point, 200 years ago, Jefferson, the vice president of the United States, broke with the sitting president. He was at odds with him. They feared Jefferson himself might be jailed. A friend wrote to Jefferson and said, what are we going to do about all this? Jefferson calmly wrote back and he said, in a matter of time, the reign of the witches shall pass. Their spells will cease to have power over us because we will look around at all the people around us. And we realize there are so many more of us than there are of them. And we will realize that we can decide the lives that we will live. All that we must do is hoop ourselves together and march against them. Brothers and sisters, it's already happening. We have a $15 in a union movement. We have a Black Lives Matter movement. We have a climate change movement. We have a rising trade union movement. More than 200,000 more people are in unions this year than in last year. Even as they have battered and fought and banged away on us, people have still organized. We have, we have a response that is shaping. It is time for us to hoop it together. It is time people to get ready and to say, we will shape our future, not theirs. Thank you. I think there's Re Mike there, there and over the there. Yeah. You want to go to a microphone, or if you're so overwhelmed by it. <laughs> it's all good. It all works out good. Oh, well, we do that all the time. <laughs> we sit around and talk about the, Bernie Sanders' polls and stuff, <laughs> Michigan. Um, but uh, if, what, what I will tell you is one, one final thing. We get ranting and raving. Be careful with that. But uh, in the back of the book, you know, I just, I just very casually kind of scoped out a couple of, the, of you know, these movements things. Back of the book, we, we devote a whole chapter to these incredible things that are happening right now. Because just as all this technological change is taking place, there is an evolving response. The funny thing is, we're going to get out of this fine. It's all going to be OK. It really is. But it's going to be very hard. And it's going to be the knowledge that sees us through, not, not what some leader tells us. So anyways, you're, if you have questions or thoughts, we will light it to take them. Here we go. Go ahead. There are, there are, thousands, or there are a million adjunct professors in this country living hand to mouth. There's 500,000 tenured professors that are better off. There's 3 million public school teachers they want to use uh, personalized learning. And how many of that cohort of three million teachers will end up eventually working maybe three hours a day and not have health care? You, you get into a heart and soul question. Um, a year ago, I was at a conference in, in Germany uh, with one of the guys who was one of the key developers of the driverless car. And he said, you know, it, his remark was an interesting one. He said, well, we're done with that. We've, we've finished the driverless car. It will, it's only a matter of about a decade, and, and, and that will be reality. Time Magazine this week has a driverless car on the cover. So he, you know, he had accomplished his goal. He's on to something new. The next goal was to eliminate tenure and to completely remake higher education so it was a task-based skill development where they would use an Uber-style app to connect people with educators who would then make an arrangement to train someone from afar on how to, how to do a task that some corporation needed or something at that time. And we would learn just what we needed to be a useful worker for a brief period of time, and then go on, and we'd have to then go on our app and find somebody else to teach us to do something else. This is right down, this is far down the track already. I, I guarantee you. The one thing we say in the book that's, that's probably the most important message, do not imagine that anything that you do, except maybe a prison guard, 
um, is, is going to be considered particularly useful in the future. And so, yes, it, it, what you fear is a legitimate fear. And as you begin to explore this, again, what you have to understand is, do, is this is our choice. Do we want a future where children might learn poetry and art and, and ideas and be fully formed? Or do we want them to be automatons, you know, going on an app to get a little bit of training to do a task for somebody that will pay them the least amount? This is, this is the reality that we will choose between. And you know, the interesting thing is that in that future, the children of the rich will not do that. They will not do that. The children of the rich will be reading poetry and studying art and having really quite wonderful lives. That's, that's how it will work. Children of the very wealthy. What we ask is this question. If it's good enough for the rich to have a fully rounded and wonderful education, why not everybody? Technology has freed us, right? It's given us so many opportunities. Why would we accept you know, this, this gig economy, this limited life, when we could actually say that teachers should be paid more, that educators should be teaching us the wholeness of what we need to learn, and that our number one investment in a time where we need to work less ought to be in education so that we can actually learn not to be workers, but to be fully formed human beings and enjoy our lives. So. Um, thanks for a really fantastic talk. I'm very, um, very excited to delve into the into the book. Um, but I, I had kind of a, a quick two-part question. Um, the first part is, you mentioned Germany. Uh, I know just a tiny bit about the issues they faced when East Germany was reunited with West Germany. So all of a sudden they had a whole lot more people who wanted to work than they had uh, well-organized jobs. And so the, as a society, they decided to do a number of things. And I, I'm I think you, you're going to be explaining, and you've already talked about some of them. But I was kind of wondering, you know, their parliamentary, generally parliamentary style of government, as I understand it, kind of let them have that conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, may, and their leaders were more in touch with what the people themselves wanted to do. Um, contrast that with the history of the populist movement, which kind of started in the 1870s, as a result of a lot of economic dislocation and the rise of the robber barons, that movement really gained a tremendous number of followers. And they almost elected a president under William Jennings Bryan. But they were crushed. I mean, just absolutely violently crushed. There's a great book about it called The Populist Moment, which details that, which I've read. So they kind of, at that time, machine politics and the politics in the United States was efficiently repressive enough to crush that very large movement of people who were, who were rebelling against a lot of tremendous harm being done to workers and farmers, so largely initially an agrarian movement. How do you see... Um, our political system today, what key thing do you think we should try and mobilize around to enable our political system to be, a, you know, to, to have some sensitivity to our plight instead of having to choose between Donald Trump and, and then and an, and a, an ideology that people are just not familiar with, um, like Barney, uh, Bernie. Thanks. Thank you. Well, what, one thing, well, I think uh, it's hard to do one thing. Our argument in the book is there's a series of things that really will rise or fall together that will make us more de democratic or not. But I would say one thing that jumps out that is imperative is the money and politics question, that the corruption that's going on with our campaigns, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and I would, yeah, and, and you know, it's not just campaign donations. It's not, I mean, that's just really the tip of the iceberg. The amount of money that goes into lobbying, we talk about this in the book, is astronomical. You know, in 1970, when a member of Congress retired, they would come back to their district, and they might teach a class at a college for a year or two, and then go live on a farm or do whatever they would do until they passed on. 
Uh, today, when someone leaves Congress, over half of them stay in Washington and go to, over to what's called K Street. Uh, and they make an income ranging from $400,000 to $2 million a year as a corporate lobbyist, over half of retired members. That's every bit as damaging as any campaign contribution or any super PAC, because if you're a member of Congress now, you know if you mind your P's and Q's and take care of people, you know, you can get rid of this election jazz and stop having to worry about that and go across the street and get paid $2 million a year as the head of a trade association or working for a lobbying firm and not have to run for election and make a pile of money. And that disciplines members of Congress to say, I know what side of the bread the butter's on. And that's, you know, what's happened in Washington in the last 40 years, the corruption, it's difficult to exaggerate. In 1970, Washington, D.C. was a sleepy, uh, middle-class town of bureaucrats. Didn't have a lot of rich people, sort of like Seattle, actually. Uh, in 1970, not today. Yeah, not, uh, you know, today, I think it's f five of the ten wealthiest counties in America are the five suburban counties surrounding Washington. It's all these fat cat lobbyists and government contractors who are digging into the government trough. And then they, in the public, they call themselves libertarians, go figure. Uh, and, you know, but the corruption is obscene. And, and it, it, it plays itself out also in a few other ways. There's been a little bit of talk in this campaign about private prisons and how it's obscene that you would let people make a profit from imprisoning people so they have incentive to keep people in jail because they make more money. Well, until the 1940s in this country, what I'm about to say, I'm glad you're sitting down because you'll find it hard to believe. Until the 1940s, it was considered obscene for private businesses to make profit off of war. It was, you know, we had, we had armaments and ships that were built by the government. It was a scandal in the Civil War and in World War I. Yeah. When World War II started, FDR, who's you know, getting a good shining tonight from us, FDR said, the one thing I want to see from this war is that not a single new millionaire is created. It was considered outrageous that someone get rich from war. Well, now that's the whole point. You know, what, what the heck are you doing about war? You can't get rich. You know, it, it, we've built in this corruption so deep wired into our, our economy, into our governing system, that it leads to a citizenless democracy. Of course you have citizenless democracy. The powers of the people who have access to the budget and load their you know, bank accounts with the money and the proceeds and then have the news media they own sort of fill our heads with their gibberish. Uh, so the money in politics, the corruption, uh, this is, everything eventually goes through there. Does, you know, that's not the only thing, because you might not win just that. Lots of other issues go with that. But in the end, if you don't clean that up, you're never going to get a democratic society. I just uh, I'll add one quick thing, and, and uh, in the book we write about Zephyr Teachout, the great uh, theorist and historian of corruption, and she says that the, the biggest crisis in America is that we have accepted a level of corruption that is literally untenable, that it makes governance a joke, that it makes it fully dysfunctional. To, to prove her point, Zephyr is this year running for Congress and trying to go out there and fix it, which is a measure of her incredible commitment. But here's a big deal thing that I, I will suggest coming off something else she says. And this isn't a reform you have to do, except with yourself. Zephyr Teachout says, the first thing that people need to do is stop being pundits. Stop being a pundit. Pundits will do that. They're going to be on TV. They're going to say, and, and you know, you'll always know a pundit because on the night before Bernie Sanders wins Michigan, they'll tell you that he can't. And, and so one thing is that they're always wrong. But what she says is the problem in America is that all the citizens have become pundits. We all tell ourselves we can't do this, we can't fix that, this is impossible, right? We have literally subsumed into ourselves, taken into ourselves a punditry. And as long as our demands are limited by us, we cannot begin to fix what's wrong in our politics and frankly what's wrong in our economics. And so I, I will say, you asked for one thing, I would say, Stop being a pundit. Vote for what you believe in, campaign for what you want, and make unreasonable demands. Make demands that are sufficient to the crisis that is coming. In the time that is coming, as people, as jobs become less, as the pressures become greater, as the burdens become greater on people, they will not turn to the pundits. They will turn to people who actually have a vision and are talking about big, bold responses. Yeah, and then people can talk to us in the yeah, receiving line. Our bar will be open after too, so. 
Oh. Great. So I, I really, I have really enjoyed your presentation also. Um, my question has to do around the book about Mr. I think Piketty or Piketty. Uh, yeah, his, his projections are pretty uh, glum, actually, uh, and he doesn't offer a solution in particular, but it has to do with this massive capital uh, and the 1%, and there's all the people who are going to be earning their keep off of investments. You know, and then the rest of the people, well, we thought they were, the rest of the people might be working, but now it looks like they're not going to be working. So I, you know, it's, unless this revolution, you know, occurs, <laughs> where, where do you, what do you think about it? It's not unless, projection. it actually does have to occur. I mean, that's the conundrum. You're right. It, it, it's not a, you know, well, there's some middle ground that we're going to somehow put a bandage on this thing. The changes that are coming are sufficient that we are going to have to change a lot of stuff. And the, the, the question is not whether there's going to be radical change. There's going to be radical change. It is a given. The question is, will we present an alternative to letting all the decisions be made by monopolized, huge multinational corporations? And if we don't do that, they, they will make the decisions, right? And so the, the way to understand this is we're not anything great. We're just a couple guys sitting up here on the stage. We got about a foot and a half on you. Um, but we have just spent some time with you and we're going to spend a little more time signing books or whatever. And we've told you everything we know as quickly as we can about what's coming your way. If you choose not to believe it, that's your right. If you do believe it, then you have to be then become deeply committed to organizing a response that is humane and decent. In the last chapter of the book, we detail some incredible things that people are doing. I'll give you one quick example. In cities across this country, uh, they are now taking portions of their city budgets to support and sustain worker-owned businesses that are local. And it is quite incredible what is happening across this country. They are literally seizing the decision power back from multinational corporations, bringing it back into their communities, supported by the government, at least with grants and, and sustained, and saying, get a group of workers together, do you a task that needs to be done, and you figure out you know, how to make it humane and functional, and we'll support you. We will, we will pick winners, right? And the biggest conservative thing is don't, we don't want to pick winners and losers. We have cities around this country. Madison, where we live, has the largest proportional amount of money in this. Bill de Blasio just started it in New York City. It is the idea of literally saying, we're going to support the creation of economies right here. And Garo Perovitz, the great thinker, uh, has been doing a massive project in a very undercapitalized section of Cleveland where they are literally forming worker-owned businesses and new structures of economics. We just have to, I mean, you should be doing that in Seattle right now. But you don't see, foresee a war being, when things get really, really bad, then wars. Well. Uh, <laughs> We're kind of trying We're to avoid that. We're not predicting one, fortunately. <laughs> We're working hard to avoid that. Next one might be the last one, so let's hope not. Um, one more question, yeah, or is that it? OK. I just want the, young, the youngest person standing up right now to come and ask a question. We'll ask and the then, then we'll, we'll two more. We'll let you These two, and then we'll have to call, pull the plug. I don't, I don't want to usurp my It's question. youth <laughs> affirmative action. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know. OK. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So um, I, I really think that like the fundamental problem and what I think is really a constructive challenge of our time is what you guys pointed out is democracy. Um, and I think a lot about this because I organized with the Transit Riders Union here in Seattle. So trying to build a democratic organization, we just constantly come up, up against how, <laughs> thank you, um, how, not just how disengaged most people are from our political democracy, but also just how unused or unaccustomed almost all of us are to like just directly participating in a democratic process. Um, and I think, you know, what Robert sort of pointed to around 1970 as sort of a high, high point in democracy and you know, various indicators. And I think it's undeniable that labor unions were really the democratic infrastructure and that supported that. Um, and I, I also think it's undeniable that a jobless economy poses some problems for the labor union model. Um, and <laughs> so I wonder Maybe what- Maybe the most profound statement of the night. <laughs> I wonder what you guys think uh, the new democratic infrastructure looks like. 
Well, we talk about that issue a lot in the book. Back in the 60s, they were talking about that too. You know, what are we exactly fighting for here at the end of our existence? Uh, you know, the new democratic infrastructure will is to be determined. I mean, that's the point, I think. And, and that's, I'm not meaning to dodge the question by saying that. Uh, right, we have right, chapters about it in the book. So yeah, I mean, I think what you want to do is set up institutions to empower people to make those decisions. And a lot of it won't be like a theoretical or hypothetical debate or an abstract debate, but it'll be the stuff John's talking about that we chronicle in the book. Communities trying different experiments and then seeing what works. And some things will work, some things won't. But we're entering a period where people are going to have to do something. Now, I don't think we're going to end up with no jobs next year, or five years, or 10 years, 20 years even. It's a, it's a long slope. What we want to do is manage it so that when we get to the end of it, it's a soft landing to a really nice place. For one thing, we're going to build the, if we're actually going to have a jobless economy, which will be a long way off, uh, you're going to have to build an enormous infrastructure. Uh, a social welfare state. Well, no, I'm talking about an economic infrastructure, an internet of things that will sort of coordinate the entirety of this uh, automated world. And that's going to take a while. And that will create human jobs to do a lot of that in the meantime. But it's the, the demo, we have, to, I mean, we have to set up the political structure so the sort of institutions are created like cooperatives, like a commitment to social welfare. I mean, for, that's why the demand for universal health care is so important today, because in this sort of jobless, gigless, now the gigless, precarious economy, where health care rights are, are not that good and then the deductibles are such to mean your actual health care for a working class person isn't necessarily that great, uh, that we need to just have it as a right so everyone gets it and to lock that in going forward. Right to education, lock that in going forward right now and build out those elements of it so we have the capacity as time comes so we can actually study, participate, and come up with alternatives to a, a future that in the current hands will not be very good. I'll just throw one quick thing in. I love the, tra I love the Transit Riders Union. I really think it's like this hugely cool thing and like way beyond Seattle. And what? The Transit Riders Union, right? I think I love it because it, I think it's a really big deal and a model that needs to be ever. And the, why I like it is that you, you had your great line about, you know, it's going to propose problems for the trade union movement. The fact of the matter is, I don't know that it does. I think that the future, what we have to do is organize people where they need, right? Because if we are changing the nature of work and if there is so much less work and if there's so much competition and, and pressure, then we need to organize people where they need around what they need. And thus, it becomes incredibly vital to organize healthcare consumers. Those of us who, who need healthcare, that would be like all of us. And we need to organize those of us who need transportation. We need to organize those of us who need housing. We need to organize those of us who have fundamental needs and meet them, begin to meet them. And the interesting thing about this is, the interesting thing about this is that, that the measure of any democratic institution is can a poor person recognize a problem and then use the infrastructure that exists to solve that problem? If they can't, then, they, then it doesn't work. Then that, that's not functional. Because a rich person sees a problem and knows how to make it work, right? Oh, I got to give a contribution. I got to talk to this person. I have to do that. They, they, it, it works for them. And so the only way that we can begin to shift that is we've, we are organized enough that, you know, we always have more of us than them. There are always more of us than them. But if we're not organized, we can't say, we can't do what the rich person does. We can't see the problem and solve it. So I actually think that the trade union movement may have to transform radically, but I don't think we have to get rid of it. I think it just has to organize in different ways. If there are fewer jobs, then we need to organize for the way to fill in those gaps and to make these things work. And let, us, let me close off here. We're, we are over and we'll take every question people have and talk to you forever tonight. Uh, as we move out, but we don't want to imprison people here for the whole of the evening. From, but let me, let me just close off with this basic notion. We started doing this book. We started, we were writing a totally different book, doing other stuff. We stopped what we were doing, literally put aside drafts and other work because we thought this was so incredibly vital. I happen to think this is the most important work we have ever done, the most important thing we have ever been involved in. And the reality of it all is I know that whatever we are doing is literally just the start. 
Like it's, it's baseline stuff. And there will have to be many more books and many more conversations and many more people gathered in a room like this. But the fact of the matter is, we have always seen ourselves out of problems like the one that's coming at us. And what's coming at us is incredibly overwhelming. I guarantee you it's overwhelming. But the fact that you have come out tonight makes Bob and I believe that we can actually do it. And the, the looks on your faces makes us more confident. And if you're a little bit scared, great. Scared is good because we should be scared by some of this. But don't be so scared that you don't go out and organize and support radical responses to a radical change. Because brothers and sisters, we are in the people get ready moment. And now that we're ready, because you've come out tonight, let's go out and fix it. Let's go out and save this world because another world is possible and it is a better world than the one we're in or the one that they would give us. Thank you for coming tonight.